Okay, everybody, it's a big show today here on This Week in Startups. We've got a transportation startup on the program. It's called Uber, and the CEO, Dara, is here to talk all about it. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code twist to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. LinkedIn Jobs. A business is only as strong as its people, and every hire matters. Post your first job for free at linkedin.com slash twist. Terms and conditions apply. And user testing, real-time video feedback, real fast, from wherever you work. User testing, real human insights. Try user testing free today at usertesting.com slash twist. Okay, but first, the news. SoftBank-backed Katera is shutting down, uh, and I think this is an important topic for two reasons. One, I want to talk to you about overfunding of startups and the problems that can cause. And then I want to talk to you about a new concept I have been discussing internally, something I call slingshot startups. And these are startups that got set back during the pandemic. But like a slingshot, they got pulled back. And all that energy built up. And now that the reopening is happening, they are moving again, but with more velocity. Sometimes you have to step back to go forward. Let's start with Katera. If you don't know, this is a vertically integrated construction startup. What does that mean? It means they tried to make construction work better, faster and taller, et cetera. So the company was founded in 2015. The CEO was Michael Marks, who ran Flex Electronics from 92 to 2005 before working in private equity. And the concept was pretty basic, offsite manufacturing with onsite assembly. So you make a bunch of parts and then you put the home together, almost like a kit car if you think about it. And maybe over time, using software and accurate planning and design, they could reduce time and build costs. And they focused on large scale buildings like apartments, commercial offices, etc. They raised $2 billion. And if this all sounds familiar, and it sounds like wasn't this the same problems we work had? Well, the largest investor was SoftBank Vision Fund. If you have a vision and you want to go big like Masayoshi san has been doing, you have the risk of putting so much energy capital and jet fuel behind the rocket that the rocket blows up on the landing pad or just goes off in a crazy direction. Like we saw with WeWork and like we see now with Katera. Katera is just totally blown up. WeWork seems to have gone off target, uh, but maybe they can course correct if they make it to escape velocity. So uh, the information did a great story and just outlined exactly how apparently mismanaged the firm was. Uh, that's Katera we're talking about here. <laughs> Obviously, WeWork also mismanaged. And we're, I'm going to get into why that happens. Um, after COVID hit, Katera was hemorrhaging money, according to sources. And um, this was because of delays, increased material costs, etc. And to artificially boost revenue, according to this story, Katera exaggerated updates on certain apartment renovation projects. Now, exaggerated updates, this could be one of these how you frame something, so to speak, and it might not be outright lying. But exaggeration can be framed as a lie. This is very important for founders who are listening, especially when you're selling securities. You want to be as honest, upfront, give as much data as possible to investors, employees, shareholders, and the broader stakeholders in a company. You never want to exaggerate or polish or massage the truth because massaging the truth for one person might be fraud or lies to an organization like the SEC or investors, right? So, uh, and typically the outcome will determine that. If you massage the truth and you have a big win, you're a hero, nobody's suing you. If you massage the truth and you lose your investors' money, now you're in court. Now the SEC gets uh, a tip from one of your previous investors who feels bad that you exaggerated, uh, or some people might call it faking it till you make it. They, they claim employees use the fake updates to front load revenue by millions of dollars in financial reports given to investors. So when I see this, my take on this is the information got this from investors who were very upset by what Katera was doing. And they took the most negative, least charitable position on Katera's behavior. That's what I'm reading into this. Because how else would the information get this? 
when something blows up and you got hundreds of people on the cap table, it only takes one person to say, you know what, I feel wronged. I'm going to give this information to a journalist. And that's um, how these things go down. Typically, Katera hired a law firm to investigate this internally, according to the story and the CEO and co founder, Michael Mark stepped down in May of 22. It's likely the board fired marks who knows. Um, but there's no indication here that Mark knew of the misleading financial reports. Most people would say you're supposed to know about that. Um, but you know, I can tell you in a company with 1000s of employees with hundreds of millions of dollars in um, investment or billions of dollars in this case, a lot of times the CEO gets abstracted from a reality and you have people feeding you information and sometimes you get disconnected from the ground truth in your business. This is why I always look at bank statements or ask people to tell me how much cash is in the bank account. I, I'll look at the bank statements or credit card charges as they happen. Why wouldn't you do that, right? Sometimes you got to get into the weeds as a founder and other times you have to delegate a little bit of both trust but verify is always in order. So in December of 2020, Katera told investors it was running out of money, SoftBank injected 200 million uh, in what's called a rescue financing. Uh, this wiped out uh, the stakes of other investors. In other words, it was a cram down probably pay to play. Yeah, I think that's the term a lot of people will use, which is, we're going to make all the equity in the company worthless. But you can buy new equity at this incredible price. So you pay to play. If you don't pay, you're, you get wiped out, but everybody had the opportunity to put more money in. So this is where you could have had a fracturing of the loyalty within the company. The existing investors feel wronged. They feel like they were lied to. They put a bunch of money in. Now they're being told their equity is wiped out. And the only way for them to get new equity is to put money into a company they feel has not been honest with them. Can you see how this is a bit of a prisoner's dilemma? <laughs> they're going to wipe out your equity. As an investor, and can you understand how this would make bad feelings? This is inside baseball, but this is what really happens. Um, so you get all these bad feelings. The company goes from a $4 billion valuation to less than $400 million, according to letters sent to Katera shareholders and in the information story. So apparently a lot of hurt feelings with other investors. So I'm guessing they leaked all this information. And according to an anonymous source, be careful with these, obviously, because anonymous sources are relied on far too much for stories by journalists. And it, frequently they're wrong, uh, or they have massive agendas. But they say the SEC is also investigating Katara's false front loading claims. Who knows if that's an active investigation, or if they confirm they received information. I, I think the SEC doesn't actually tell you based on my experience, they don't actually tell you what's going on. They'll do a document request is my understanding from attorneys I know who work in the space. They'll just say, give me all the information. That doesn't mean there's an investigation. It means they want information because they just want to check things out. The uh, shutdown announcement comes and Katera, which had 8,500 employees before cutting it down to 2,400 after numerous rounds of layoffs, sent an email to the remaining employees on June 1st, Tuesday, following a thorough review, I'm quoting here, of strategic business alternatives, Katera has determined that it must wind down the majority of its U.S. business operations effective immediately. Unfortunately, most of our U.S. employees will no longer be working for Katera in the, new, in the near future. That means you're fired, by the way. Just say you're fired. <laughs> An executive told employees on a video call they didn't have money to pay severance or unused PTO, a person who attended the meeting said, again, an unnamed source, who knows if that's true, who knows if that's speculation. Um, if it if they don't pay those things, then I believe the board members and the CEO and, and uh, folks like that could be on the hook. So there are specific laws in specific regions about factory shutdowns and the notice you have to give employees. And this is called the Warren Act, W-A-R-N, I believe. And this requires employees to provide employees with at least 60 days written notice of plant closings and mass layoffs. The purpose of the advance notice is to provide the employees with transition time, enable them to find alternative employment, or to enter a skills training pro program under the Warren Act. Uh, mass layoff is a reduction of force within a single site of employment that results in an unemployment loss during a th any 30 day period of either 50 to 490 employees that represent one third of the total active workforce at the single site or 500 employees or more. So you get an idea. It's, it's basically if you do a plan closing, you got to at least give people some warning. And if you give them notice, you don't have to give them severance. It's just giving people a heads up here, common courtesy. And for a company that raises billions of dollars to not give that common courtesy is just lame. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business, blog or publish content, 
promote your business, announce upcoming events or special projects, and sell products and services of all kinds and more. No matter the problem, Squarespace is the answer. They have beautiful templates by world-class designers, but that's not it. They also have powerful e-commerce functionality, and everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box. So no matter what you're using, an iPad, a Surface, an iPhone, an Android phone, it doesn't matter. All these beautiful templates just work. And of course, it's got built-in SEO, free and secure hosting, and 24-7 award-winning customer support. Uh, we, we did Remote Demo Day in 2020. We were suffering through the pandemic. We were confused. How are these startups going to get funded? And I said, you know what? Throw up a Squarespace site. It's a project. Maybe it turns into a business. And boy, did it ever. We have now funded over uh, a dozen companies, over $14 million in funding, and this all from setting up a simple Squarespace website and tweeting. So go to squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial. Squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use the offer code twist and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And congratulations for the team going public by direct listing on May 19th. What an amazing journey it's been. Just super congratulations. I know you you all worked really hard over there to get the product to scale and to delight customers and it's just delightful for us. And we look forward to having you on the pod, Anthony, to take a little victory lap. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Now, um, I don't speak for Blockable, but I am an investor and on the board of that company. And they were constantly being told, and the market was constantly saying, you can't be Katerra, they're over, they have so much funding. Uh, why are we not raising all this money like Katerra? And I think if you're in a slow moving industry, like construction, education, healthcare, no amount of fuel is going to allow you to drive that train faster. In other words, the rails of the railway system uh, are capable of a certain speed. You can put a high speed train on the railroad tracks for Amtrak, and it will go flying off the rails. <laughs> you, you operate in the real world as a foundry. You cannot go 300 miles an hour on tracks that were designed to go 60 or 70 miles an hour. It really is that simple, folks. You know, just watching, you know, other founders practice good financial hygiene, give good, honest updates regularly to your investors, reach out when you need help and, and do things properly and take your time. Product market fit takes time. And I think what a lot of people learned in the construction space specifically, and I know Blockable learned this, was you don't, you can't just fix the product. You can't just make a better mousetrap because that mousetrap then has to be laid somewhere. And that is called a city or a town or a state or a country. And those regions and geographical regions have regulations and they have local boards and people will, NIMBYs will fight against and NIMBYs will fight for. And then there are people who own the land and there are developers. There's many stakeholders in this ecosystem. And so Blockable decided they would be the developer themselves, not just sell the units to developers. They were going to actually, and they are owning the properties that they're building. And so, you know, we know there's a housing crisis. We know there's technology to make homes in factories and then deliver them to sites and that that works much better. And the homes you build inside of a factory are perfect. They can be cut by lasers as opposed to in the field with like a, a straight razor, what do they call it? An exacto knife when people are cutting sheetrock in the field. Imagine everything being modular and you're not building bespoke homes and every home is different, but you're building Legos and you just stack those Legos as you go. That would be much, much more efficient because the hundredth, the five hundredth, and the thousandth and the ten thousandth home would get better and better and you get the operational efficiency. So building the tenth home is going to be ten times better than the first. And the hundredth might be 20% better. You get the idea. You get all of these great uh, economies of scale. And you get to learn in the field how that unit behaves in terms of the HVAC and, you know, how energy efficient it is. So these are all wonderful innovations. But I think what we'll see, and this is what I want to end here on um, with Katera and this absolute disaster and burning of shareholder money and apparent mismanagement and classless end where you stick it to your employees, <laughs> which I'm sure the severance packages for the senior executives were locked in and, and they were watching the bank account and making sure they got theirs. I, I'm almost certain of that. I would bet donuts to dollars. I don't know what that term means, but I like donuts and I like dollars. So I would bet donuts to dollars. Uh, if I win either side of that bet, I'm in good shape. So I've been thinking about slingshot startups. These are startups that got paused during the pandemic. And when you pause, you reflect. 
and you cut costs and you go through every single line item and say, what can we cut out here? And then the energy built up consumer demand. So we have a company called Neighborly, N-E-Y-B-O-R-L-Y.com. And they rent space for offsite meetings, birthday parties, etc. Now in a pandemic, <laughs> nobody can do gatherings. So they were shut down 100%. Cafe X, you know, doing coffee in airports. Well, airports are shut down. And then you have Uber, nobody can take rides. And you have blockable modular housing. Can you be in the field building stuff? I think they were somewhat affected. But if you look at neighborly, now, after the pandemic, sadly, all these retail stores open up because storefronts went out of business. So that adds inventory. And then Neighborly also has uh, everybody coming back and saying, you know what, I, I missed my 50th birthday, our book club got paused. Let's start this up again. Let's, let's YOLO into the roaring 20s. So more people are going to book. And so they have more inventory, um, they have more supply and more demand. Amazing. Cafe X. Oh, okay. People are concerned about touching products and everybody's into cashless and everybody learned how to order on their phone. Okie dokie, Cafe X, no human. And you get to serve the coffee without touching anybody else's hands, without anybody sneezing in your coffee, God forbid, or um, any, you know, kind of hygiene issues. And people know how to order on their phones and set up their, you know, Apple Pay or Venmo or Cash App. Wow. And then think about this people uh, are not coming back to work and they don't want to work as baristas. They don't want to work as uh, Uber drivers. They don't want to go back to teaching. They want to work from home. Okay, if people don't want to be baristas, <laughs> it's fine for a robot to make a cup of coffee for you or give you an iced tea and a bagel when you're at SFO. So it's, I think this is a really interesting uh, lesson for everybody. I know for me, I have really been thinking about this and I had a lot of tough conversations with founders. You may have heard that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pretty blunt and candid if you've listened to a thousand episodes here. Shocking breaking news. Jason is candid. Dun, dun, dun. Anyway, the candid discussion I had with people was cockroach mode. We need to cut all expenses to zero as quickly as possible and survive the pandemic. And then after the pandemic, let's see if we thrive. So, you know, really interesting, I think, uh, what happened with Katera. And just real quick, Bill Ackman, who, uh, you know, announced the largest SPAC ever. Is buying uh, ten percent of the Universal Music Group for four billion. I, people seem to be disappointed about this. That he picked like a really safe, smart, easy play. Uh, you know, as you know, music libraries are worth a lot, and Universal Music Group they own Bob Dylan's catalog and Lady Gaga, Taylor Swift, Billy English, The Weeknd, Queen, The Beatles, yada yada, and uh, they just print money from Spotify now. So I know that Sean Parker was rumored to be buying them a decade ago. But here it is. Now it's going to be public. They made $9 billion in revenue, according to uh, our research here in 2020. 4%, not even 4% growth, but with $1.6 in profits. You know, it's five times revenue. People were kind of disappointed in this because a lot of people buying SPACs are looking for things that are big tech, big ideas, not a catalog, which is kind of like buying a bond, right? Like basically you bought a bond. I think people were thinking Bill would be able to do something really creative or interesting instead of something, you know, boring like this. Uh, and, you know, maybe he could get Starlink to spin out of SpaceX or Stripe or Robinhood. People were speculating all kinds of interesting companies that they could have taken public. And they've been holding this for six months. Uh, so their money was tied up in a flat spack and they could have done more with it. So Contrarian Short, which is a Twitter handle, says PSTH dipping on news it's targeting a growth profitable business and not a fraudulent ev fintech or space travel co i would say the fraudulent ev thing is accurate fintech i think is such a strong space i don't i don't th i don't suspect um there's fraudulent fintech out there that i've seen in the spac groups and space travel i mean that is a moonshot <laughs> get it um but space travel is is a very real thing i mean i don't think anybody's going to debate that rich people will pay 50 bucks uh 50 000 bucks uh fifty thousand dollars which to a rich person is like spending 50 bucks, I'll be honest. Uh, for somebody worth $100 million, spending $50 or $50,000 is kind of the same for them. And so to go to space for $50,000 or $250,000, it's a once-in-a-lifetime YOLO experience, no big deal. But let's get to the interview. A startup in the transportation space is back on the program. Uh, that company is Uber, and I might have been the third or fourth investor in that company. Uh, but today we have the CEO, Dara Khazrashahi, on the program and so much to discuss, but uh, great to have you on the program, Dara. Happy to be here. I think you got started with Uber a little bit earlier than I did. So uh, slightly, it's slightly, cool. yeah, slightly. <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, you know, it's 
Uh, I, there's so many ways to go with this interview, but I thought we'd start with the most topical thing. Everybody's wondering about wait times. I'm here in Austin right now. Uh, wait times were like, it was an Uber Uno, as we used to say in the early days of Uber. I got my Uber in one minute. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> there are scattered reports in cities of 15-minute wait times, uh, which for the record is like a third of the amount of time you would wait if you called car service in Los Angeles or other cities. But <laughs> We have trained people that you can get an Uber in one to five minutes in a city, and now it's back up at 15 minutes. How are you doing with that? And what's the strategy there to get back down to the, the elusive Uber Uno when, the, when it shows yes. up and you see them across the street? That, that, that's when a beautiful thing happens. So we, we are on our way, but there's no question right now, as we're coming back from the pandemic, demand has returned much faster than supply. And and. You know, the, the way I like to talk about it, demand is a fast twitch muscle and supply is a slow twitch muscle. The supply of drivers and couriers always adjusts, you know, as any market does to demand, but it just adjusts more slowly. Mm -hmm. And then we're leading in because, you know, we could we could let things go and between surge and pricing and driver earnings, which are really high, like median driver earnings are 35 to 40 bucks in most cities right now per hour wow. and that reminds me of flexibly. Like 35 to 40 bucks an hour reminds me of the early days of uber when it was just black and and that was just so we're clear here that that the national federal minimum wage i think is seven dollars an hour so we're talking yes. about five or six times the minimum wage it's a good time to drive for uber and of course you've, you've got complete flexibility right yeah. so usually under normal circumstances the market would take care of itself supply and demand would get balanced but we don't want those kinds of wait times we don't want mm. these uh large surges that you hear about once in a while so we're actually leaning in and really getting the word out there uh as far as drivers and the earnings opportunities and how great they are and we are seeing drivers come back to the platform uh, and the wait times are still not where we want to be. They're they're still longer than kind of perfect. Like usually you want to get them to four or five minutes on average. We're above that. And pricing sometimes is above that because of the supply demand imbalance. But all of the directional movement is in the right direction. The wait times are coming down. Prices in general are normalizing. And we're pretty confident in the back half of the year we'll get to kind of the old Uber that you're used to, right? And, yeah. and for, for, for me, like the, the lesson is, is really cool, which is that the way that technology moves, these experiences that you rated as magical, like push a button and a car comes, right? When they become normalized, expectations go up so much. Whereas like a magical experience used to be a magical experience when you invested in Uber. Yeah. Now it's like if you push a button and your car doesn't show up in five minutes, you're like, what the hell's going on? This is, yeah. you know, why am this I waiting for the five minutes? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we, uh. we, we want to get back to acceptable and best of breed. And, and we're on our way, I think. Growing your business takes more than offering a popular product or service. It's essential to have the right people in place to ensure your company operates smoothly and has the potential to expand. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the best candidates for free. Hiring is definitely part of my strategy here at launch. We just hired a curriculum designer who's doing an amazing job. We hired a second producer, Justin. Amazing job. Do you know where we find the most qualified candidates? LinkedIn, of course. And I'm going to give you an amazing offer in a moment to put your first job on LinkedIn jobs for free. You basically get to hit that 740 million member network of professionals on LinkedIn. It is ginormous. And if you're willing to do remote folks, you're also going to be able to hire people from around the world. You just fill out a bunch of targeted screening questions. Uh, that's my favorite thing to do to ask people what do they read? What news sources do they like? And you want to get in front of the people with the skills, experience and motivation you need. They've got great filtering and management tools. That's all just done inside of LinkedIn. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. When your business is ready to make that next hire, find the right person with LinkedIn jobs. And now you can post your job for free. Just visit linkedin.com slash twist. Again, that's linkedin.com slash twist to post a job for free. Terms and conditions, of course, apply because they're giving you a free job posting. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. That's a great segue into drivers, which uh, we didn't know this, but I guess, you know, this stimulus and extra unemployment is creating a certain condition where... 
hey, if you want to get people to come back to work, it has to compete against maybe some of those unemployment benefits or some stimulus. And that's obviously running out. But uh, of drivers, I'm curious today, how many are looking at flexibility as the most important part of working for a ride sharing company or a delivery company? Because it does seem that office workers now are demanding flexibility. And many are saying, you know what, if you want me to come back to the office five days a week, I might, I might look for another option because I kind of enjoy staying home. Um, well, how many of the drivers, just ballpark, are changing the number of hours they work meaningfully week over week? So flexibility is by far, by far, the top feature in terms of if you're a driver or a courier. That is why people work on our platform, because essentially they can choose when, where, how they want to earn. And by the way, they can be promiscuous. They can work on multiple platforms as well. It is by far the number one reason. Now, what we are hearing from drivers now is the number one reason why they are hesitant about coming back to the platform is actually safety, right? Like huh. we've been through a year and a half of the virus. Uh, not everyone is vaccinated. Uh, I'd say on average, our driver's vaccination rates are a little bit lower than huh. our rider vaccination rates as well. Uh, and so safety is the number one concern. Once we get past safety, they know that they've got the flexibility, which is really cool. That's like, check, most important thing. It's awesome. And then third is, hey, are my earnings opportunities going to be there? Because early on and during the pandemic, sometimes drivers experience, hey, I've got to go drive 15 minutes. J just like we don't like to wait as a user, drivers yeah. don't like to drive too far or uh, you know take too much time for their pickup. So pickup times were long. Mm -hmm. And drivers were saying, hey, am I going to get the earnings opportunities the earnings opportunities because of demand are absolutely there. They're arguably better than they ever have been. So now things are moving absolutely in the right direction. But flexibility is like, flexibility is king. That's what and, drivers and want. If you were forced to be full time, you would lose that flexibility and you'd lose that ability to be promiscuous and go from service to service. If people worked for one company, if they had to work for DoorDash, Lyft or Uber or any company, and they couldn't work for the others, then they would be doing shift work, which means they would have to show up at a certain time, check in, and then check out eight hours or 10 hours later. D does any driver to ask for that to have a shift? It, so that they, seems they, like they, something they would not be interested in. There's a minority of drivers, and I would describe it as 10 to 15% who want a full time job want to do it, you know, full time and would rather be employees. I mean, it, but yeah. and, and so that is real, but it is a minority of drivers. Listen, the, the way that I like to describe it is if you're a barista at Pete's, right, mm -hmm. uh, making coffee, you can't decide all of a sudden that I don't feel like showing up for morning rush. Uh, and you know what? On the way home, I'm going to go work at the Starbucks because it's closer to home. And I'll come in whenever I want and I'll leave whenever I want, right? Pete's needs you there during rush hours. Pete's mm -hmm. is going to need you there at a particular store at a particular time because if they're employing you full-time and playing you a salary, they've got to underwrite your productivity, right? Mm -hmm. And so for us, for example, we need more drivers during rush hour in city cores, but drivers can elect to make that decision whether they want to you know, work then and there or not. And that is the trade-off in terms of flexibility. And the other trade-off, which we think is pretty cool too, is that drivers essentially, we get a commission, right, off mm -hmm. of driver's earnings. So the better driver you are and the more experience you have driving, your earnings go up because you understand the, the tricks of the trade, when to drive, where to drive, et cetera. And essentially, our interests are aligned. For a full-time employer, mm -hmm. you essentially can afford to pay uh, the utility of the average employee, you know, plus some premium because there's some added value. But essentially, there are going to be some employees who are too, you know, you don't pay them enough because they're much more, they, 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 they create much more value than the average employee. And then there's some lower than average employees that you're lifting up. With our system, essentially, drivers or couriers make what they put into the system. And they're yeah. great drivers and great couriers. And there are some not so great drivers and not so great couriers who then decide to self-select to do something else. So that's one of the cool things about an open system. You essentially earn 
relative to your productivity as well. But the flexibility is by far the most important factor. Yeah. And it, now if you look at it, there was this whole concept that if Uber drivers or Lyft drivers or DoorDash drivers or any ride-sharing drivers were going to be classified as employees, well, what about hairdressers and real estate brokers and freelance writers? I'm in the media business. I, a lot of uh, the same publications that were giving ride-sharing companies a hard time, my friend Jim Bankoff runs Vox, you know, my understanding is they had to cancel because I had some of those rights. They had to cancel every freelancer in California because if the freelancer worked over X number of hours, now it triggered full time and it caused chaos. So they just opted out of that market. So where is the United States as a country? Um, and obviously Uber and DoorDash, I think, are kind of having to navigate this most of all. Where are we with this archaic system where either you're full time or you're a freelancer? But with this caveat, if you're a freelancer, and unless you're, you know, got a really great lobby, or you're an elite freelancer, like a real estate person, you're, you can have freedom, but the people maybe who are starting their careers can have freedom. It seems incredibly un-American to me that people can make their own choice. But putting that aside, is there a third way that's better? That's what we always talked about in the early days of Uber, was there has to be a third way here, because you know, that that would seem more equitable, maybe if somebody works over 20 or 30 hours, I know you've been revving on this pretty hard. And, and that's, that's actually that third way is what we're trying to shake now. And, and to a large extent, that was what Prop 22 in California was all about, which is how do you retain the best of both worlds, right? The, the really cool thing about being an IC is you're your own boss, you're the CEO of yourself, uh, and you get to be totally flexible based on when, where, how you work, and based on productivity. There are good times to work, right? There are good ways mm -hmm. to work uh, as well. But how do you combine that with some of the, I think, important elements of, you know, call it traditional work, which is a safety net, protection, healthcare coverage, uh, et cetera. And that's what, you know, we call it IC+. Plus. Actually, in the UK, there's a third designation. There's ah. IC, there's worker designation, and then there's full-time employee. And worker is, is essentially an IC plus pension benefits, some vacation benefits, et cetera. And in the UK, we have designated drivers, essentially workers. And now we are in the process of having discussions really on a state-by-state -state level because the needs every state's needs are different and these are workers, you know, in the state to hopefully come up with this third model. Flexibility of an IC, the freedom of an IC with protections, whether it's minimum wage or a fund for healthcare or other benefits as well. And I think like it is the better way forward. It takes time, you know, uh, government sometimes moves slowly, but by design. But I do think this is the better way forward and we're pretty optimistic. Yeah, independent contractor status with maybe if I hit a certain benchmark, is there a certain benchmark you're thinking? Because I think the average number of hours for full time employment is 2000. Pretty easy if you want to do this at home 52 hours a week, 40 hours, 2080 is the number of hours per year. So if somebody did 1040 hours, that would be half time. Therefore, they could get half the benefits as a full time person. This doesn't seem so difficult for yeah, even we're me not, to comprehend. <laughs> we're, we're actually not looking at a benchmark because to some extent, what do you pick? 20 hours, 30 hours, 40 yeah. hours. I think those are, you're just kind of picking it out of your head. Yeah. We're really indexing, right? Which is if you work 20 hours uh, and 90% of drivers, for example, work less than 40 hours, right? Like that's right. the vast majority of drivers. The vast majority of couriers uh, work far less than 40 hours. But basically, you index the benefits based on how long you work. And the other, I think, cool idea is you pull together the hours that you put into all the platforms, hopefully. Uh, it's an idea called ah. portable benefits, which I think is really cool, right? Which is, hey, if, you, if, if it's just based on how long you work for one company – uh, and how many hours you put into Uber or DoorDash, et cetera. That's one solution, and, that's, and it's not a bad solution. I think that's some are going to go in that direction. There's another concept, which is portable benefits, that if you work 10 hours on Uber, and let's say 10 hours on Lyft, you actually get benefits worth of 20 hours so that yeah. you retain that freedom to, to work with multiple platforms. I think both ideas are good ideas, and hopefully, you know, depending on a state-by-state -state level, which is the right idea, we'll go forward that way. Yeah, and... 
I think people are forgetting that you are 100% dependent on drivers. There is no business without drivers. It's in your best interest. In fact, I would think it's your obsession to make this a better opportunity for them than other opportunities they might be presented. Is, am I correct in thinking that your competition is people working at a Starbucks or a Target or a Walmart versus deciding to be a, an IC or an IC plus? Totally, totally. And, and drivers are our, are our customers, right? We have a right. driver app. We, we run that app just like we run our rider app. Hmm. And it's in our interest to attract the customer, to give them a great experience for their earnings to be excellent, for the flexibility to be there, and then for them to stick around. And our competition is exactly uh, what you said, the warehouse, Amazon warehouse worker or, or someone who might work at, at Starbucks, et cetera. And what we offer is flexibility. I've spoken to so many drivers who, you know, I remember one was a, uh, she was an actress and her mom got sick and she had to take care of her mom. And she's like, this is a pretty cool gig. And now she's an actress and she uh, works on Uber as well. Um, I, uh, I rode with, uh, with a driver who during the day, she'll drop off her kid during the day. She drives people. And then in the afternoon picks up her kid and hangs out with her kid and delivers for Uber eats. Like these, these kinds of stories Amazing. would be impossible, uh, with other full-time jobs and they're possible. So it's a, it's not for everybody, but there's a self selecting group of people who want the freedom and want the flexibility, and we've got to be there to give it to them. Are you launching a new product, developing a new prototype? Maybe you're rolling out a new campaign? User testing lets you see, hear, and talk to your customers to understand how they experience your brand, products, and services. Put yourself in the customer's shoes with real-time video feedback. The user testing human insight platform allows you to target your exact audience, ask them any question, or give them a task to perform. How interesting is that? It's a tech platform that connects brands with their target audiences in order to get feedback on any experience. Testers can get paid 10 bucks for their time. These users aren't doing this to get rich. No, they're doing it because they really want to help make your products and services better. So watch, listen, and observe their reactions so that you can connect the dots and keep improving your product and service. You'll get feedback within hours and strengthen the relationship with your coveted customers. User testing is used by startups and the world's most innovative brands from all trails, Grammarly to Microsoft and Capital One. Here's a testimonial. Chubby's is a men's casual apparel brand that gained valuable insights by asking some of their customers to explain why they love Chubby shorts. They also asked for new product suggestions to guide their product roadmap. Think about how brilliant that is. It builds fiber between you and your customers because they feel heard. And we all want to be heard in this life. Experience what your customer experiences by using user testing. Request your free trial at usertesting.com slash twist, usertesting.com slash twist, and get the fast human decisions you need to make more informed business decisions at scale. We talked earlier about getting used to something in society, like low wait time for a car to transport you somewhere. People forget 20 years ago, there were people who needed to make money this weekend because they somebody got sick, they missed a rent payment, credit card was due. You know, maybe they don't have a big savings and their car blows the transmission. I, you know, I grew up in this situation where my parents had to like have the car pushed across the street from side to side because they had to wait to have the money to fix it. This happens to people. And, you know, Travis's, uh, you know, early idea was you push a button, you can work. You just think about what an amazingly meaningful contribution that is to society as a safety net. Forget about a welfare safety net and people getting free money, UBI, unemployment. How about people are empowered, they can press a button, and if they needed a little extra cash, a little extra cheddar in their pocket, they can get it for what their need is at that moment. Do you feel sometimes people underappreciate this massive innovation? Uh, I think totally, but I would also say that um, we do need that safety net. So sure. the one negative that I've heard about Uber is uh, sometimes when you get started, it's one, it's, it's tough. You kind of don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes your earnings aren't as strong as you think that they should be. And you kind of don't know why. So mm -hmm. I do think that what Travis created was this incredible like free market system as it relates to labor. Yep. And free markets have their weaknesses, 
right? Mm-hmm. And part sure. of the weakness is that uh, people fall through a safety net. Yeah. And just like our free markets, you know, we talk about inequality. And to some extent in our system, the averages are excellent, the flexibility is excellent, but there are some people for whom the system doesn't work and we've got to do a better job. Hey, here's what you can be doing better. Or we know that you didn't make much money this this, this week was a bad week. Here's some extra to help you get to the next week, et cetera. You know, mm. also being self-critical, I think the system works really, really well for 80%, 90% of the participants. There's 10% that is not working as well as it should. And we've got to make sure that we put the effort when into the 10%. Yeah. When it doesn't work for that 10%, is it because they're in a region where there's not enough liquidity in the market and they can't get enough rides? And that's just a function of, hey, you know, Uber just doesn't work as well in these rural communities because the time between homes just to get to a home to pick somebody up might be 45 minutes. Yeah. Usually they're working in the wrong place or they're mm-hmm. working at the wrong at the wrong times. Mm. And we just have to be more prescriptive in helping them out. And listen, sometimes you get unlucky, right? Sometimes you'll be waiting at the airport for 45 minutes and you get a ride uh, that is 15 minutes long. And that sucks. You know, frankly, that sucks. So I I think those are the edges that we can take off. And just like in our markets, you know, the capital markets are beautiful in so many ways. They don't work for others. And I think, you know, Uber and Lyft and, and, you know, Uber Eats, we've created this incredibly free flowing and liquid labor market that anyone is welcome to, right? Like anyone can come into the system and come and earn as long as, you know, you pass a background check and you have a decent car, anyone can come into the system and start earning. Uh, we just have to do a little more on making it work for everybody. Even if you have a last name that's Greek or Iranian, that's hard to pronounce, you still get the job. I mean, exactly there was a time people for people forget there was a time when if you showed up with the last name like the you and i have on a resume people you might not get an interview and when i had jason mccabe my mother's maiden name i got a lot more interviews than when i had calicanis that's my last name um let's talk a little bit about uber eats uh this has been just a stunning stunning uh growth uh billion dollars a week was the run rate last i saw uh and people may or may not know this but there was a time when eh, maybe some board members, maybe some folks uh, in the press said, Uber Eats is a stupid idea. It's taking away the focus from Uber. They should be a pure play. Just do Lincoln Town Cars, the highest profit, maybe Uber Select, but get rid of Pool, get rid of UberX, and get rid of Uber Eats. Don't do anything but the most profitable part of the business. You held your ground and kept doing Uber Eats. And that, in fact, during the pandemic showed we were anti-fragile. So maybe your thoughts on having this two-pronged business, which does take two different skill sets, I would think, or there's some overlap? I think that it's um, there's actually a decent amount of overlap. And listen, early on, it was difficult to fight against the grain and hold on to Uber Eats. Uh, the person who I'll give credit uh, to is Jason Drogi, who kind of yeah, uh, had the idea and built it, and and he was uh, convincing enough, and he towered over me, so he kind of intimidated me into <laughs> making sure that I I supported Uber Eats as well. But listen, it was it, it was. Were you it, on the you fence know, he, about it too? <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. When I came when I came into Uber early on, like I didn't even think about Eats. I was thinking about the business, the the mainline business, and Eats all of a sudden was this discovery, uh, and and. You know, just as any new CEO would do, I gave myself 100 days, let me figure out what's going on. But I was so impressed with the work that the Uber Eats team had done with the growth rate of Uber Eats. And and just like rides, it's a marketplace business, but it's a three-sided marketplace, right? You got mm. eaters, you've got uh, stores, uh, restaurants, and then you've got couriers as well. And a lot of the logistic capabilities, the mapping, the real-time matching uh the the real-time pricing all of those capabilities that we have built on the mobility side are very much applicable to the delivery side uh the person who's running delivery now pierre was the number two on the mobility side so it actually building these two systems there's a lot of common technical elements amongst the two systems and what we have demonstrated we were pretty late to the eats game right but we have actually now we're the biggest player globally outside of china 
uh, like you said, we're at a billion dollar uh, per week run rate. And boy, it got us through the pandemic. I mean, I, I, I would <laughs> I, I would be, uh, I think, a very I feel very differently coming out of the pandemic were it not for eats. And I think now we're in a position where the mobility business is coming back. We have a great problem, which is we don't have enough demand. Uh, we don't have enough supply relative to our demand. And the Uber Eats business now it is at a completely different run rate. And both sides of the business, you can argue, are going to be huge hits going forward. Yeah. And, and the entire driver network gets to have two different options. In, you know, if people are going back to offices, we'll see, you know, they might want food delivered from that 11 to one o'clock hour, which, by the way, happens to not be <laughs> commute time. So the same drivers, exactly right. if they want to grab a couple of extra hours delivering, how many drivers do both, like on a percentage basis? I mean, I'm sure it depends it's, on market, but it, it, it depends on the market. So in the US, where you have the greatest overlap, for example, in a London or a Paris, most couriers are driving scooters. So there isn't that much overlap mm. between yeah. uh, uh, drivers for people versus drivers for food. In the US, uh, you had probably pre pandemic, it was 10 to 20%. Mm. Then it went up because during the pandemic, you had a lot of drivers who found earnings opportunities with Eats. So it was, it was 20 to 30 plus percent. Now it's going back down because the earnings opportunities in driving people are higher than the earnings opportunities in terms of driving uh, food or driving things. Uh, so it shifts. And that's the really cool thing about our marketplaces. You know, it's constantly shifting between supply and demand and the interactivity dynamics between the two are always changing as well. Uh, so another like misinformation kind of virtue signaling moment that kind of happened with Uber and delivery of food was some cities wanted to set a limit on how much you could charge, not even knowing that you hadn't yet gotten the business to profitability, or maybe just in the face of not even admitting that you were losing money on every ride. And that's, you know, you're, you're essentially the person benefiting from that is the restaurant and the driver and the consumer. The person losing is Uber, <laughs> which is trying to build a business, obviously, and in the long term, that should make sense. Um, but you, correct me if I'm wrong, also offer people they can use Uber Eats, a restaurant, and bring their own driver. And then how much do they have to pay Uber if they bring their own delivery service? Uh, usually 15%. Yeah. So I mean that that is the the headline number that sometimes people quote, right? Is mm. oh Uber or DoorDash, some of the others charge thirty percent, sometimes twenty five, sometimes twenty percent. What they don't say is the majority of that goes to the courier, right? There mm. is a cost to delivery, yeah, and 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 the majority of of the restaurant commission goes to the courier. And our take at Eats historically has been about 10% net of everything. If you look at everything right. kind of, and for a marketplace business, that's actually a pretty low take. And we think Very long low. term, what, yeah. we, what we've told investors is probably our net take is going to be closer to 15%. And I think that is, you know, you can call it fair or unfair, but it's a, it's a, very fair take rate compared to other marketplace type businesses. And we think it'll be a sustainable model. So sometimes people do things, you know, reflexively. But long term, usually you get to the right answer. Yeah. And, and it's very interesting. It's the same people who are arguing <laughs> drivers should get paid more. And then when drivers do get paid more, they're blaming Uber <laughs> or DoorDash for paying the drivers more because it's coming from the restaurant. What people don't realize is delivery is not cheap. There's a human being involved with carrying your food to you. It's, there's going to be a cost here. The other thing that I think you don't get credit for is these are drivers who you know have driver's licenses and who are paying taxes and who have been verified. When I was in the restaurant business growing up, that was all an underground economy and people were not getting paid even minimum wage. They were getting paid two or three bucks in cash from the register to deliver something and whatever they got in tips. So if they made $5 a delivery, $7 a delivery, and if they had three deliveries a night, they made 20 bucks. And if they had 10 deliveries and it was a good night and they got good tips, they made 50 bucks. That's how it worked in Brooklyn back in the day. This was an underground economy. This is an above ground, really professionally run economy. And, and we're bringing these folks into the banking system, et cetera, you know, and, and I think that's an additional benefit as well. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. and, and listen, the, the tips, as you said, are on top of earnings as well. And it is what we found certainly in the pandemic was there was a big part of our population that needed help. And 
I think we kept an awful lot of restaurants in business and we created a lot of earnings opportunities for couriers and drivers. So we got to do more. But I think between that and the activity in terms of giving free rides for people, for medical workers, uh, you know, fighting in the pandemic, free food for them now, free rides to the vaccines, et cetera. I think we're doing our part here uh, to kind of be the kind of company that you can be proud of. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been exceptional, uh, your leadership and, and tightening things up and, and changing, I think, this overall perception that Uber was a marauding company. Uh, you know, I think you've done a pretty great job in that, to be honest. Uh, but when, you, w- when we look at vaccination, how do we think about vaccination in drivers and in customers? I just went to Madison Square Garden for the Knicks games. You had to show proof of vaccination. Uh, but the Uber I took there, no vaccination, no cards. What, now that you're seeing people using vaccine cards, is that something you're thinking about for drivers? I know you've got a driver shortage, but if I said I only want a vaccinated driver, could I pick that in, in the app? Are you even thinking about that? Or do you think the pandemic's just going to work itself out? You might as well ride it out rather than I, I think this, customers and drivers having to opt in to say they're vaccinated. We're, we're definitely thinking about it. Typically, what we do is we take our lead from the CDC or kind of the the, uh, the the health authorities and their advice. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes private companies don't recognize that they're they're not. You know, we we got to recognize that we're there to serve the public, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So I think for now, uh, we've got our mass policy in place. You know, roll down your uh, your window, et cetera, and we've seen that that's a safe environment. Um, if there's advice from the CDC that says, "Hey, you should do something else," we'll certainly take it. But our philosophy has always been. We want a safe and open system that's open for anyone who wants to get from point A to B and is open for anyone wanting to earn money. Mm -hmm. And we're not at the point now in terms of vaccination percentages where, you know, we would say, hey, you've got to be vaccinated and which which could exclude a certain percentage of the population. But we're definitely thinking about it. And it's something that we're going to revisit. I wonder, you know, you, you have a driver stimulus. I think you're giving people spiffs or bonuses for coming back on yes. board or doing rides. I wonder if, you know, you showed up with your vaccine card, if you got an extra hundred bucks in your account, that would motivate folks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, r- right now, we're just offering free rides to get vaccinated and, and it's especially yeah. targeted against the younger crowd. The, you know, you and I don't belong in that crowd, Jason, no, but the 18 no. to 35 <laughs> crowd, like they, they, they yeah. I, I don't think feel particularly vulnerable. Um, and that's a pretty big audience for us. So we're working with a White House. Essentially, we got we're taking their data. Who's got vaccine appointments ready? Where can you walk in? And essentially, you get a free ride to and back. You know, for two vaccinations. Amazing. That I think is a pretty cool drive to help. Uh, and then you know we'll we'll be creative about other solutions as well. Yeah, I think it, there's such an amazing opportunity for you know as Uber really contributed with the free rides for vaccines and delivering and saving these restaurants and keeping them in the game, keeping them solvent to, you know, have some sort of notation of who's vaccinated in the system or, you know, and an opt-in system. It doesn't have to be like, you can't work for Uber or DoorDash or Lyft if you're not vaccinated, but it could be, hey, there's a subtle optim, opting in and that has some benefits that come with it. Let's talk about profitability. Uh, there has been this... Uh, concept that, oh, this business can never be profitable. We both know that's ridiculous because there have been various cities in Uber's history that have been wildly profitable. There have been various categories of rides that have been wildly profitable. So, And even in the money losing days, I divided at one point the loss for the quarter with the number of rides. And I think it was 50 cents lost if you went across rides. And I said to myself, if you add it, if you made every ride 50 cents more, you would not lose that many rides. Um, so how are you doing with this sort of path to profitability? I know you put out their Q4, I think, of this year, getting towards profitability. How confident are you in the profitability of the core ride share business? Obviously, Eats is you know going to be a lower margin, but it's it seems like it's quite probable that that also will hit profitability. Yeah, I'm, I'm very confident. And we talked about hitting profitability sometime in the second half of this year. Mm. Uh, I think people sometimes forget that the mobility business pre-COVID was profitable and actually yeah. had thirty percent EBITDA margins, uh, and had paid was able to pay for hundred percent of our corporate overhead, uh, and it was really our investment in the eats business pre COVID hmm. that was causing the losses, right? And right. and like you said, 
there were some people who criticized us for that because we could have been a profitable company had we not invested in EATS pre-COVID and right. the debate would be gone. Now, fast forward to a year later, thank God we invested, <laughs> whether we're lucky or smart or a combination of both. Yeah. Thank God we use EATS and lost money on EATS because now it is a huge part of our business. And with our EATS business, you know, the way I look at it is the run rate quarterly losses are about 200 million as it relates to EATS. When we merge in Postmates, that'll be about 50 million of synergies. And the EATS run rate now on a quarterly basis is 12 and a half plus billion dollars. One percent of that is 100 you know, $25 million. So yeah. this is, we're now getting at scale where mm -hmm. we absolutely need mobility volume to come back because mobility is the big profit generator for us. And that's why we're leaning into supply to make sure we have enough drivers out there to drive mobility profitability. Assuming we succeed there, and I'd say so far the signs are good, uh, then we can also move each you know, on a positive profit path while reinvesting for growth because yep. the potential there is still huge. And, you know, we're pretty confident it's all going to come together in the second half. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that debate uh, over with. <laughs> and then and then hopefully the debate will become on how much growth we have ahead of us, which I think will be a good conversation. Uh, and you've also simplified uh, self-driving. That's been spun out. Vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, that's been spun out. And I think trucking also. Uh, no, trucking is still uh, part truck, of the business, trucking. Uber Freight. Yeah, so Uber Freight is part of the business. Tell us why Uber, so that means Uber Freight must be doing phenomenal. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> you kept, that, you kept those two cards in the deck. So tell us about Uber Freight and how that's doing. I, is it Le Lior still running it? Yes, Lior is still running it. Uh, okay, so he's and, a Google, and, former Google exec, is known for being a killer. Um, so that's a reason to keep it. But how, how's it go yes, doing as a core business? It, it, it's doing great. And the, the, the way I describe Uber Freight is, you know, in the olden days, when you wanted to call for a taxi or car, you had to take your phone and you had to call a dispatcher or a yeah. broker, right? Who would then call the car and take a huge margin. And essentially, that's still happening in the freight business in 80, 90% of the freight business. People are calling these brokers and they're calling their trucker friends and, and putting it together, et cetera, and taking these giant margins. And... We are simply, and a bunch of the original Uber engineers who built kind of the original system, we are essentially taking that offline process, we are digitizing it. Uh, now, it's a much more complex process, right? Lots, lots of bills going back and forth, but essentially the, the, the trucker experience uh, is much, much better. Get, they get paid faster, they can see all the loads, they can pick and choose what load they want to take. They can take routes that keep them closer to family and closer home. And for a shipper, they just see so much more inventory in terms of uh, the availability of truckers, et cetera. And ultimately, because we're connecting these two marketplaces, we take a lower margin, which creates more liquidity in the marketplace. And, you know, you get the network effect that you associated with, with Uber, which is more riders meant more demand for drivers, more drivers meant a better, you know, ETA, et cetera. Same thing for shippers uh, and truckers. More shippers, more demand for truckers, more truckers, better service, and the liquidity whole thing goes. marketplace. Yeah, runs liquidity perfectly. happens, pricing happens. We get to take down uh, margins. Everybody's happy. Truckers actually get paid faster, better, etc. Their experience is better. They 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 rate you know pickup depots. How long did I have to wait, uh, etc. So all of the elements that made Uber what it is incredibly special. Uh, we're essentially building for freight. Uh, and, you know, the signal that I see in that business is just dynamite. So we got some of those really expensive bets off the books, tightening up ship, smaller footprint of a company, profitability within sight, all fabulous. But you did a little bit of acquisitions. You went after Grubhub, Drizzly, and Postmates. You got two out of three. Uh, yes. And you even tipped your cards a little bit. Hey, maybe cannabis is now legal in a lot of states. The NBA is letting players you know uh consume if they want to it's legally delivered in california and many other states and there's i guess meadow and other companies out there who do this delivery we do delivery mm, seems like we're in the delivery business H how do you think about um the three acquisitions that you went after and the two you got maybe we can go through each one of those and then also this sort of one hanging out there of cannabis 
Yeah, so I think that the cool thing about our footprint is I actually think the footprint of the company is bigger because of the delivery business, right? The delivery yeah. business, when, when I was thinking about how big the company can get, you know, you kind of draw some paths as it relates to how big mobility can get and delivery can get. And delivery got so much bigger faster mm-hmm. that when we step back and said, hey, like, what are the opportunities? We just got this giant opportunity that happens to be like right in our backyard. So like, why go and take a moonshot when the moonshot like right next to you? And like, yep. you just have to step over, right? And so with delivery, we said, hey, let's define delivery as much bigger than food. This is delivery of all local commerce. And for us, we can become the company where any place you want to go or anything you want to get uh, to your home, we can offer that to you. We understand your identity. We know where you are. We've got your payment details. Uh, we have a membership program and kind of the vision is just like Prime owns, you know, next day, we want to be the next hour company for you. Next hour, mm. go get it, uh, go anywhere. Next hour, get anything. And that can include food. It can include grocery. It can include alcohol. Uh, and, you know, if cannabis becomes federally legal, et cetera, that's something that we'll look into. For, we're looking into pharmaceuticals. The categories that, w- that we want to get to are fast and frequent, right? Mm. What are the, the categories where you're going to have high frequency so that we become kind of a habit? And what are, th- what are the kinds of items where you want delivery fast? Uh, and food is definitely there. Grocery is there. You know, pharmacy is there. There's some other categories that we're looking at. And I think the majority of the growth is going to come through, uh, through organic growth. But we will go out there and buy companies when we can accelerate that growth like Postmates and or a category that we're super excited about or a management team that we're super excited about. And that's Corner Shop and Drizzly. Ah, yes. Corner Shop. Explain to people what was uh, appealing about Corner Shop. Corner Shop is, you know, the Instacart of Latin America. They started in Chile, a small team expanded in Mexico and now in Brazil. Uh, Just a dynamite team who, who, grew up not in the land of plenty. They, they didn't raise hundreds of millions of dollars. So, so they got the system and the product right without a lot of capital. And essentially now they have built a terrific grocery product. And we can put that grocery product in front of our audience on a global basis. So it's a little bit of the best of both worlds. It will cost them hundreds of millions of dollars to introduce them to the kinds of size or the audience scale that Uber has. We can instantly put them in front of our uh, in front of our audience, and it's already a great mature product. So this means there's I don't know 500 SKUs that people consume very regularly, whether it's soap or toothpaste, deodorant, milk, whatever it is, coffee. You can narrow that SKU list down to things that are essentials that are frequent, as you said, frequent and fast, and then this could become essentially you might pick off a lot of the Instacart orders or Amazon Prime orders that would come to my house. Yeah, listen, the, the grocery uh, grocery online penetration is way behind where food penetration was. The grocery market is just as big. There's an overlap between prepared grocery food and, and restaurant food as well. And we're working with big grocery partners. You know, we got a partnership with Carrefour in, uh, in France, et cetera. It, is, it really is. Instacart has built a great product in the U.S., we have the international global audience. Mm. So we think we can get out there very, very quickly. And again, uh, we offer Corner Shop the Uber audience, which is second to none. So in order to build a business like that and go up against Amazon, Amazon had this incredible ability to tell the market, you know, don't expect this to be profitable, expect this to just be, you know, $1 profitable or $1 not profitable, but we're going to go for growth and expansion. Do you think the market is going to allow you to do that now that like, and it would be this sort of great irony, you you kind of tighten up the ship, you get to the point where you hit that break even mark, are they going to let you invest in building out this essentially one hour Amazon? I think thinking of Uber as the one hour Amazon is mind blowing in terms of the scale and potential of the business. And it really does open up a lot. I think if we prove ourselves in mobility, and then we prove ourselves with Uber Eats and food. And we show, I think in mobility, there's no doubt in my mind, we're going to show the market it's only about getting the driver supply back and Mm -hmm. and we see good signal there. If we show that we can get eats from losing, you know, close to 200 million to uh, break even as well, I think the market will start getting it. Listen, Amazon, 
they were doubters about Amazon, right? In oh, the early yeah. days. Like, it, it, was, it, it wasn't smooth sailing. Yeah, like, no. you look at the stock chart and it looks beautiful now, but there are lots of ups and downs. But once they proved themselves, you know, once, twice, three times, people started believing. And I think mm. we've got the opportunity to prove ourselves with mobility, with delivery. And I think there'll be a group of investors who say, you know what? They did it twice. They're going to do it again with grocery and then with freight. And we'll get into the ne- next category as well. So we got to execute. But I think the stage is set pretty well for us. I, it feels really nice, actually. Um, now, uh, as we get to wrap, because I know you're busy and I appreciate your time, Pool as a product obviously doesn't work during a pandemic. Uh, and Uber Pool as a concept, um, you know, to my memory, when you know Travis was conceiving of it as a product, was it had a multifaceted purpose. One was this would be better for the environment. Then also, it would be better for cities in terms of congestion. Um, and for Uber, and it'd be good for drivers because there would be this never ending ride, right? The ride would just keep going. You'd have 2.x or 1.x people in the car at all times. So the never ending ride. But it was not going to be a big money maker necessarily for Uber. It was going to build out the the network of drivers, and it would allow people who maybe could only afford a four to ten dollar ride, as opposed to the eight to fifteen dollar ride, to access it. If the pandemic, let's say we have zero cases, does Uber Pool come back? Do you believe in Uber Pool? How do you think about Uber Pool? Uh, you know, in the context that I've given in terms of historical, um, you know, have, since I know where some of the bodies are buried. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually excellent context. Uh, yeah. Context. No, I, I totally believe in in, in the idea. It helps with pool, congestion. Yeah. It helps with the environment. Yeah. Uh, it takes the pricing envelope down, which is something that we're always looking for. Mm. Uh, I think the issue with pool was um, the our company got addicted to discounting to drive volume and didn't work hard enough in perfecting the product to drive volume. You know, there, there, there's an idea of uh, you know, product market fit, right? And and in the go go days, we discounted, and we thought that meant we were building a really good product. You know, and discounts got great volumes, but actually, with pool, right, you get an efficiency from having two people on car, three people on car. You can use that efficiency to essentially give it back to the the rider in terms of a discount. The discounts that we were offering were much greater than the efficiency that we were able to drive mm. from multiple people in the car. And those two weren't coming closer together. So we did a bit of a reset pre-pandemic, which is, hey, let's actually start pricing pool truly in terms of the efficiency that we were creating. And we had some really promising results. And then the pandemic hit. Yeah. Uh, so oh. we will bring it back. Uh, and, and the other product that we're actually working on in uh, in Egypt right now is actually high capacity vehicles. So we decided mm. to actually go out and test, call it pool on steroids, which are larger vehicles. Uh, they can take up like to 20 passengers. Van or like, like a, a sprinter bus. van. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Minibus, et cetera. And with those kinds of vehicles, we actually think we can push the efficiency envelope because there's only one driver and there's only one vehicle and you can have more than three riders. And that, I think, holds a lot of promise to really reduce the price envelope. And for us, you know, we want to open up on-demand mm. transportation to not just the upper what middle class. What do you class. call that product? What do you call that uh, the bus we, product? We call it, it's, it, it's very creative naming. It's called Uber Bus. Uber very Bus, creative. there you go. <laughs> what you reinvented the bus, Dara. Amazing, no, I mean, right? Yeah. Well, when you would go to Park City, when I was broke and I would go to Sundance, I couldn't afford to rent a car, nor could I afford to take a, a taxi from Salt Lake City to Park City. And they had this $10 bus and it would drive around. But the only problem was you're either getting picked up between 4 and 6 a.m. or 6 and 8. And it would just drive around for an hour and pick people up in Park City and then drive you to the airport. So if you were the first person picked up, it could be a long morning and you were getting to the airport three hours before your flight. But if you're broke and you got to go to the Sundance Film Festival and it was only 10 bucks, it was, it was, uh, it was well worth it. What, what, oh, but, um, but if you, yeah, but yeah. if you could reinvent the bus yeah. with dynamic pricing, dynamic riding, dynamic schedules, mm. that, that can create lots of efficiency and, you know, we'll pass on that efficiency to riders to, to take prices down. So there's a next gen bus out there and we want to be the ones who build it. Uh, as an 11 year shareholder, I've been hearing, you know, that, uh, self-driving cars would kill Uber <laughs> for 11 years. 
uh, and it was always going to kill Uber in three to five years. And every three to five years, we, you know, listen, I love Tesla and um, Elon's my bud, but, um, you know, the cars are great on the highway with self driving, but self driving locally is still a challenge. You've sold off the Uber uh, self driving unit, and there seems to be five or six people making really credible runs. What's your best guesstimate as to when? a city has self-driving without a driver. In other words, no steering wheel, total autonomy. Because it doesn't matter until that point. It's the same as Uber. It's the same car structure if there's a safety driver in there. Am I correct? Uh, you're correct. And you know what my answer is going to be, Jason. <laughs> Three, Three to five, five years. years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, if it, it does, it, okay, if it does happen in 10 years, where so, would it happen first? I mean, it's, it's yeah. really hard to understand. Um, Based so on what I'm so let, 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 let me try it. And, and this, is, this is real guesswork, but call it educated sure. guesswork. I believe in three to five years, you are going to have fully autonomous driving for certain originations and destinations and certain routes that are the right Got kind it. of routes. You know, uh, they, they are mostly highway because highway autonomous is going to be easier than, let, let's say, mid-city uh, mid autonomous, et cetera. Um, and... That will happen in small volumes. And the advantage that we have, I think, is we can, listen, if, if you're building a um, fully autonomous rideshare network, then essentially you're only going to work in a subset of the city during s some subset of times. And that doesn't, you know, you want to push a button and you want a car. Like, you don't care uh, about the complications that happen in the back end. What we can offer, and we're working with Aurora, and we're a big shareholder of Aurora, and Aurora is run by, uh, you know, the founder of Chris Ermson, who was one of the original founders of yeah. Waymo. And he's really put together a technical team that's second to none, along with their ATG team. And we can, on a live basis, say, you know, four years from now, if there is that, uh, that hail that comes from the right origination the, and is going to the right destination, we can have an autonomous car serve it. Hmm. And, you know, if not, we can have a driver uh, essentially service it, it, it as well. There, there's this drama of people saying, oh, robots are going to replace humans. The fact is, with most automation, et cetera, robots and humans are working together yes. in a hybrid manner, right? Like For the sure. Tesla, e even the Tesla factory is yes. a combination of automation and humans doing 100%. the complex, unpredictable stuff. And the same thing is going to happen with well, we Rockshare, which 26 is 26% of Aurora. Is that right? It's 25, yeah, 26%. Yeah. So we are well in the game. And with that strategy, other investors are going to help shepherd that. And that lets you focus on the businesses that are right in front of you. I mean, it's also a focus for you, right? Like how much focus can you and your executive team have if you're trying to boil the ocean? We are great. We're great at building networks, real-time supply, demand, uh, and pricing and matching. And, and there's, there's wonderful detail and there's wonderful science and, and product mm -hmm. in that. Building autonomous cars and building hardware and you know these hardware life cycles that are two years long, et cetera, it's just a different game. Mm -hmm. and, and to some extent, it's very hard. Like One of the really cool things about the Apples of the world or the Teslas of the world. And there are very few companies like that that are excellent at hardware and are excellent at software, right? Yeah. And, and the magic comes when you put the two together. We decide like we're going to be excellent at networks, matching demand and supply, and we're going to let someone else be excellent at hardware. Mm -hmm. And we're going to plug in that hardware, just like we're going to, you know, we Makes want Toyotas sense. and Chevys and, you know, uh, any other car on our network. We're going to want Aurora cars first or our drivers first. And then, you know, you can see us working with other people down the road as well. Uh, you were the dark horse candidate, I guess, to get the job. There were a bunch that of people. That was the unknown. They were the, the unknown. The rumored third person, yes. The rumored third person. Uh, we knew you because of you were at running Expedia, right? Like, so, yes, and you yes. were part of that IAC mafia. Like, you were well known in our circles, but maybe not in the, in the wider uh, national circles. Uh, but you maybe had some reservations about taking the job. Um, are you sitting here three, four years later? How do you feel about that decision? One of the best decisions of my professional career. You know, I, uh, it's, been, um, it's been incredibly hard. It's been incredibly challenging. But I think actually, like, we attract the kind of employee who likes hard, who likes mm. the challenge. And I love building a product that the world cares about. Yeah. And, and, what, what, and what I really love, like, the, the founding team did an incredible job 
building Uber to, to what it was. But like fundamentally still, Uber hadn't solved the sustainability issue, hadn't solved the safety issue, um, hadn't, uh, hadn't necessarily, you know, uh, solved some pretty, uh, like the feature work, which we talked about. Yeah. We are now kind of like, I've taken what they had built and yep. we can take it to that next step. So Uber's growth continues to kind of do good in the world and continues to grow kind of in concert with how the cities of the world want to want to grow going forward. And like, we get to reimagine how people and things move in a city. Um, we touch hundreds of millions of people on a, you know, on a daily, monthly basis. It's great to be in my seat. I love it. Yeah, I mean, just the fact that you're creating so much employment in the world. I, I always watch, I mean, you can't say this kind of stuff. You, you've got to be very diplomatic, I understand. But I always watch the, I mean, it's, it is part of the job, right? I mean, you, you, you represent a huge workforce and, and on a global basis with many different jurisdictions. It's never been an easy job. It, certainly, you know, one of the reasons why Travis did so good in the job is was he was able to fight so many jurisdictions to even have Uber exist. It couldn't have existed if you didn't have Travis in that seat fighting tooth and nail to just through sheer force of will make it exist in a place like Las Vegas or London where it was, you know, people said it would never be allowed. And now it's allowed and, and people people uh, absolutely love it. But it just this crazy narrative, you know, of the Elizabeth Warrens or, you know, some of these folks, Bernie Sanders, that, you know, I think they really don't appreciate what an amazing social safety net push a button and get, you know, high paying a multitude, a multiple of the minimum wage that exists today because of the work you're doing at Uber. That to me is amazing. Just that anybody who needs work can get it today, right now, sign up. Whether in, you're in New York and you want to run around with people's lunch and do Uber Eats, or you want to drive an SUV, I mean, you, you can get that opportunity to start a career and be entrepreneurial. I think yeah, it's just I think that, wonderful. That, that when I talk to Uber drivers, the number one reason why they love Uber is, hey, I can be my own boss. Like, I get to call the shots. I can be my own boss. And, and I'm responsible for how well I do. And, and, mm. and I do think for us, we do have to be better right? If it's not working for someone, how do we help them out? We do have to be better about creating expectations. Hey, if you go out and drive on a Tuesday uh, from, you know, 8 p.m. to to midnight, what can I expect? What should average yeah. earnings be? Where should I drive, et cetera? So, I think that we can still help, you know, the average and the people who are doing really well, they're really, really happy on the system. Right. There's still we can get the system to work for everybody or as many people as we can. I think I think listen that when when you listen to a Bernie Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren, the the core that they're talking about, which is there's this inequality within a country that is doing incredibly well, and that the system works for the majority, but there's a minority for whom it doesn't work. That core comes from a good place, but let's not destroy, you know, the system that's working uh, to, yeah. to 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 make it work. But, you know, the, I mean, the, be honest, go that, after that McDonald's. McDonald's has fought the minimum wage increases every step of the way. I don't hear them lobbying against the fast food companies, which are trying to preserve like $10 an hour work. And they the only reason why McDonald's and these other folks, I can say this, maybe you can't say it as strongly, but the only reason those companies have raised their wages is because of the competition from Uber and DoorDash and Lyft. Let's be honest. Even Apple was paying pretty low for the stores a couple of years ago, and they lost a lot of those store workers who had to work shifts to people who could set their own hours being a driver. And that's what competition does. That's what free markets do. And I wish people would appreciate that part of why you get a one minute or two minute wait time is because there's a free market and you, hey, yeah, you may have to pay a little better with surge pricing, but that's how it is. You ever think about taking away surge pricing? People complain about it all the time. That was always polarizing. People must lobby you internally. I have a great idea. Let's get rid of surge pricing. What do you say when they <laughs> come to you and say that? So, so we have uh, in there are certain places, Las Vegas, for example, where we could not apply surge pricing. Mm. Uh, and the reliability of the product was horrible. So yep. surge pricing, like you need surge pricing to to match uh, supply and demand. I think that you and what we have done now is create limits around surge, right? Mm. So don't allow things to surge at 5x, 10x, etc. 
But I do think having dynamic pricing, which encompasses search, and having d- dynamic pricing to the driver, but right? mm. a lot of people forget that when we search price, the driver's making a lot more money as well. It's not, yeah, you that's know, why us. they come out and pick you up on a Saturday night on exactly. New Year's Eve. Nobody in their right mind would work for, you know, the average pay on New Year's Eve or Thanksgiving or whatever. If you want to have drivers give up their holiday, give them a premium. Just like we would expect. It's overtime. Listen, traditional work, it's overtime. Uh, And that essentially is what surge pricing is. And and we have now modulated it and we have kind of improved and optimized the product so that, you know, surge is higher than what we want it to be right now. But but people in a balanced marketplace, it works as design and we don't get many complaints at all. I love the surge pricing. It was always just a matter of communicating. In the early days, people were really upset about it. I remember talking to Travis one Saturday night until like one in the morning. I was like, did you ever explain why we have this to anybody? It's like, no. I was like, when you explain it to me, it makes total sense. But it doesn't make sense to everybody else. We should write a blog post. And we wrote a blog post. (laughs) And that was like a famous moment for, I think, communicating well with the audience. And he wrote this blog post. It was very seminal on how to how to uber new year's eve because it was like during these hours it's going to be surging more but if you wait till 1 a.m and you go home at one you're going to be fine and if you get to your party before eight you're going to be fine if you try to do that eight to 1 a.m window you're not so just uber right on that night if you're trying to be on a budget are these rent-a-car things working i saw you guys are offering to bring me a rent-a-car if i needed to drop it off or is that like an, ex- yeah, just an experiment it's, uh, it, it's it's well it's an experiment but the volumes and the experience more than that is uh. is really promising which is deliver oh. the rent a car to you you don't have to wait at a counter etc mm. so we like what we see and, and the whole concept there is like we 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 want to move from being essentially a car hire company mm. to being a true transportation company any way that you want to get from point bus, a to b if you want to rent a car bus yeah anything that you want if you want to take transit uh you know we want to offer that to you uh and even now we for example bought a company called autocab in the uk as well to build out systems for taxis, essentially mm. back-end systems for taxis, give them the kind of dynamic mm. pricing that we've got, and connect them to the Uber demand as well. So that we think can extend ah, the marketplace. So that's, and That's software for a cab company to build their own Uber-like system, and then they can put their drivers into the Uber network. Correct. Ah, they, can, they can have so. their own front end, and they can plug into the Uber demand as well. So this is really about extending... Mm our services and making it all you know i think i think one of the really really cool things talking about surge that travis and team did was you make a you know underneath the system is actually these incredibly complicated algos etc that are doing huge amount of work but they do it instantly so that the consumer for, for the consumer is like push a button get a car you know payments uh taken care of the negative is that you lose the context of why something is surging. And it's hard mm. to explain because you make it so damn simple and so damn fast. Mm. Uh, and I think extending the definition of Uber uh, is and, and making every single interaction, whether you're taking the subway or taking the bus or taking a, a uh, e-scooter or you're taking an Uber, making it all delightful uh, is, yeah. is, is really going to be a great experience painful. going forward. Taking out the pain was Travis's rallying cry. Like that's why <laughs> yeah. he wouldn't put tipping in, and I was I fought him on tipping forever, and uh, I couldn't you win that right. battle. Well, I mean, I understood his point, which was it just adds another cognitive dissonance moment. You have to, oh my god, I'm a joy. Is it included? Is it not? And he had the idea of a six star, like a hidden star. You would hold down the fifth star, and then it would br- a six star would come up, and you could give a tip. I was always tipping in cash, but tipping that's has worked awesome. out. Tipped out worked out pretty well, I think. Yeah, it's it, it's helped that driver earnings, and I think anything yeah. that helps that driver earnings uh, is a good thing. And and you know it creates an incentive for the driver mm. to provide a better service and above and beyond uh, service to earn that tip. Uh, and we think any kind of a product that drives that kind of uh, quality, it's a good thing. All right, final question. I, you mentioned that the workers in London were going to be more full time ish, or I've got the term you used of art in London. Or in England, uh, they're, they're workers, which is essentially IC plus, right? IC so plus. it's IC plus pension benefits and other benefits as well, which is essentially the model that we want to go forward. Yeah, with in it makes the US total as sense. Well. So if that is the case, does that mean you will be able to like say, hey, you have to wear an Uber logo jacket or shirt, and you, you have to, uh, you should only work for us, or you, we need you during these specific times? 
Can you dictate a little bit more of uh, what you need as a company uh, as opposed to you can be, with an independent contractor? We may be able to, but mm. honestly, that's not what we're looking to do. That's not what we're mm. trying to accomplish. It's it's it. retain flexibility, give some benefits. Got it. Uh, and and I think it's a good good way forward. Ultimately, it's a better way this IC plus model. Yeah, I always felt like it would be great if like you could. I, I always said it, the worst case scenario is if we have to go full time with the drivers. The benefit, the person who wins, it just cements Uber's victory as the number one player because all the drivers will go to Uber because we have the most rides. And then you can have everybody wear an Uber logo and you can put an Uber logo on the side of the car, which right now you can put like a little sticker maybe, or they can put a sticker, but we can put a full Uber. All right, listen, Dara, this has been amazing. Thanks for coming on the pod. And uh, I'm still a very large shareholder and uh, very delighted to see your incredible focus uh, and your decisiveness on these issues. And I hope the markets realize how brilliantly you've gotten us to here and give you that ability to, to keep investing. I like to see you have that ability to invest, maybe get some cannabis on the road, maybe get some you know, drinks going, not for the drivers, deliver <laughs> it to the customers. You know, I'm not saying that people are smoking cannabis a lot. I don't know how frequent it is, but I wouldn't say in California, it's infrequent. It seems to me that's a really good buy. <laughs> Jason, I think you have a future if you ever want it in our IR team. So just let us know. Absolutely. But I think you're doing okay with the podcast. <laughs> I'm doing okay with the pod, but uh, this has been great. <laughs> really appreciate the time and uh, continued success getting drivers on the road. If you're a driver, this is the time. It's a Go good time. Make 30, 40 bucks an hour. Get that extra cash now. It's going to be a YOLO summer. It's going to go into the fall. Just grab all that money, put a down payment on your house or pay down some bills or mortgage. Now is the time to be a driver. Go to uber.com to sign up as a driver. How's that? Sound plug? financial advice. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <Get that. laughs> all right. Thanks. We'll see you all next time on this week's service. Bye-bye.